tonight, Dave's going to talk about uh, exploring the Al Shirak range in Kyrgyzstan. Can I first say that uh, I think this whole uh, talk and the whole business of the Kyrgyz expeditions was very much an Eagle Ski Club affair. And um, expeditions tend to become famous because they're doing particularly gnarly things rather than exploring the areas that um, might not be so incredibly difficult to get into or technically difficult to climb in. But uh, I don't know of any other ski expedition, uh, which uh, series of ski expeditions, which have so thoroughly explored a, a particular area, uh, except for these, where four expeditions went into the Akshirak range which was virtually unexplored at the time and uh, uh, managed to uh, both do some original traverses, the first traverse from south to north and to climb in the process, a total of 17 first ascents of mountains, most of which were higher than Mont Blanc. So um, it was quite uh, an interesting, um, business to get involved in, and very much, as I say, an Eagle Ski Club affair. Um, it began with Chris Watkins in 1998 trying to run a trip which never quite got off the ground owing to logistical problems, but there's, the germ of an idea was there, and then that was picked up um, by uh, Steve Wright later. But I should say something about why it wasn't uh, explored, because um, uh, just a couple of points about Soviet mountaineering, because Kyrgyzstan was a Soviet Republic and the mountaineering was very highly organized in the Soviet Union. So that um, the main focus was camps, uh, camps in the summer, camps in the winter, which um, tended themselves to focus on competition. And there were points for difficulty and difficulty was compounded by altitude. So um, the main focus was the Caucasus and the Pamirs with um, awards like the Snow Leopard Award for people who managed to climb all five of the uh, significant 7,000ers in the Pamirs, uh, Lenin, Kantengri, Pobeda, Communism and Gorzhenevskaya. Uh, that was one way in which the, fo the focus was particularly pronounced, but also in, a, in Kyrgyzstan, there was a lot of climbing went on near to Bishkek in an area called Ala Archer. So um, all this passed that Chirac by and having established that, because it was because it was neither hard enough, nor high enough, nor convenient enough for the Kyrgyz or Soviet visitors from other republics to be interested in climbing there. So it made a very fertile ground for first uh, ski ascents. Okay. Um, just so you can get your bearings, uh, here's a general, very generalized map of Kyrgyzstan with Bishkek here and um, the road south to uh, Osh, where the access to uh, the peak Lenin and peaks like that are is obtainable. And um, here you've got China and you've got uh, the road from Bishkek, this more or less, less of a motorway. I use that term in the most general sense. Um, from uh, Bishkek over to Ribachi and then around Isikul Lake uh, to uh, a junction at uh, Bar School, where the Lakeside Road continues to Caracol, but there's a key road south into the mountains, up the Bar School Gorge, over the main range, and ultimately going behind the Akshirak range, and with very rough roads linking through uh, to this area here, back to Caracol. But um, the Akshirak range is here to the south of Isikul, and that's the road that we were going to use for access. One of the main problems in getting access to ski mountaineering areas 
uh, for expeditions is that in winter, most roads uh, are, tend to be blocked by meters of snow. We were very lucky in this case that there is a gold mine on the flanks of the Akshirak range, which meant, which has very low quality ore. So mining continues throughout the year, throughout the winter. And that means that the road is kept clear for consignments of uh, gold ore, uh, semi-refined to be uh, transported out by large trucks. And that was what we were relying on to get us in. We were hoping that the pass beyond that road where it turned off for the gold mine would actually be open. It's the Suek Pass, which would allow us to come back round and cross the river or reach the cross river crossing where the bridge crosses the river there and obtain access to the Karase Valley to get right up into the range. But as it turned out, um, we had mixed luck with that. So um, that gives you a sort of general picture of where it is and our problems of access. And this is the range itself. Uh, this is the Karase Glacier draining into the Karase River, which runs out beyond the range into uh, the valley beyond the limits of the range. The Karase Glacier leads up to a watershed here and then down and there are various alternatives for exiting this way or this way, but then you'd have transport problems getting back to Karakol. And the easiest way out is definitely down past Lake Petrov and onto the road to the gold mine road. The gold mine is actually established in this area here to the southwest of Lake Petrov. And None of these peaks had been climbed. All these 4,000, 5,000 meter peaks had not been climbed, including the highest in the Northern range and the only one which was named, which was Kyrgyzia at 4,946 meters. So that was one of our prime objectives. So as I was saying, um, Steve Wright uh, picked up the baton for this, for organizing an expedition in 2003. And here's the team a very piratical looking Steve Wright there, and uh, Mike Sharp, uh, who had a lot of Antarctic experience at the time in the middle, and a filmmaker, Joost van der Valk on the right, young lad, uh, very much the hippie he seemed to us at the time, the old timers, um, but he, uh, he came along, a Dutch guy, uh, who now actually uh, runs a film company in London. He no, he's no longer quite as hairy, I think, as that, but there you go, you know, it's been a few years. So uh, that was a team, and this is actually on the way out when uh, there was less snow, so they could send uh, a four-wheel drive uh, vehicle that wasn't quite so heavy duty to pick us up, but it's the best shot of the team, basically. Now we got up to the uh, approach, the turn off from the gold mine road towards the Suic Pass, and this is what greeted us, a, a snow plowing vehicle running into extreme difficulties. And we talked to the guy and some of the locals uh, and they said, it's gonna be days before that's clear. So we were left with no alternative, but to head on up the um, gold mine road and the locals had told us it was possible to ski a pass, which was normally only used for horses and on foot in the summer. But it would be possible to get through the mountains by this pass on ski. So we headed off for the um, off the road, and almost the first thing we found in the um, flatlands by the river, which drained over the Suez Pass, were snow leopard tracks which was quite a surprise to us because we just weren't expecting to find them quite as easily or quickly you know we'd heard about snow leopards in the area but no so there we were scanning the area these seem pretty fresh but never saw a sign of them uh, we traveled in to the uh, southwest um, aspect of the range these mountains uh, in the background are not uh, particularly, they're, they're all about 4,000 metres high. They're not particularly jagged, but, all, but they were 
quite respectable ski mountaineering objectives. They were not basically on our list though. We intended to go over the pass and uh, get down onto the uh, river, uh, which we expected to be frozen so that we could get up onto the glacier and do the first traverse. But uh, the weather wasn't so good and we'd made an unfortunate decision to rely on double carries rather than sledges or haul bags. So we were seriously delayed by, um, by that. We found it difficult. We also found we were suffering from altitude and illness so that we did not make good progress. And we got over to you know, the area of the pass and it was taking us much longer than we expected and realized that um, given the time allocation we had, we might be able to get onto the glacier, but we'd never be able to complete the traverse. So we needed to, we would get there, maybe explore a few mountains and then have to come back. So it'd be a long, long journey with very little reward. So ultimately we decided that we would stay in this area uh, and do a reconnaissance, see what we could see of the peaks in the main area, see if there were ways into it from this, and possibly get down over the pass onto the river and recce that. So this is um, Juice and Mike on one of those exploratory trips. Um, Mike's uh, white thermal underwear was a great idea reflecting the sun, but I have to admit there was something granddaddy about it when he was wandering about there. So uh, I think there are a lot of shot, not a lot of shots of him. Uh, we set up a camp uh, having made our decision. And as you can see, there's more mountains in the background there to the west that we, uh, we could climb. And then we went off, did some ski mountaineering. Uh, this was one of the peaks, as I mentioned, not very good conditions. And it was very clear that they'd been climbed before. You know, the, the surveyors had probably used these points to um, survey the range because they'd never actually got into it. Uh, but we never did find out what this um, what this sort of cage on the top of this pyramid was all about. There weren't any clues. Uh, here's Joost trying to shoot some film in some very dodgy conditions, and he never was very happy with his results. But we pressed on, uh, did a few more peaks. Most of those in the background there, this, this area here, we climbed, we went up here, uh, we got over here. Um, it was, as you can see, the slopes and a nice angle for skiing, and uh, it was very pleasant, mostly pretty non-serious stuff. Uh, the main problem would have been avalanche, but it, the weather was such that um, it was only later in the trip that we got to worry about that. This is uh, Steve uh, skinning up, and this was another area we got into. It was very isolated, very conscious of the remoteness of the place. Uh, we were several days from the road by then, I think two or three days from the road. And uh, there were only two helicopters in Kyrgyzstan, which the military had first call on. So we could be in a queue if we had an accident. Uh, nice weather there, very nice weather, very enjoyable. Um, some of the peaks were a bit more spectacular than others. And uh, there was some great skiing as well. It was really, uh, the snowfall tended to make the skiing pretty interesting. But then, then despite all the clothing these guys are wearing, uh, that was during the phase when it was quite pleasant exploring these peaks. Um, but then it got warm, it got very warm. And um, Hughes at one point said, you know, we'd had some bad weather and it was warm after the bad weather. And he said, you know, if we were in the Alps, we wouldn't go out on days like this. And we were still making plans to do it. So it was a, you know, a sobering thought. And uh, we talked about our options and uh, the guys decided that what they wanted to do was to go over the pass and go on uh, recce, the river approach, which was fine. Great, but it really just didn't appeal to me at the time. I was really enjoying my skiing and there wasn't going to be any skiing on that reconnoitering trip. 
So I said, you know, fine, you guys carry on. I'll stay here. I'll ski some more of these peaks and I'll be very, very careful. It's probably not something I'd do again, but, you know, we were all pretty confident in each other's skiing ability. I remember Mike's comment actually at one time after our first descent, he said, well, that's a relief. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, I've been on some of these trips, you know, and there have been some right turkeys doing racing snowplows. So I was really worried about that. But you guys can ski. So that was that was encouraging. And he was a telemarker. Very, very stylish. So uh, here they are sort of packing up, ready to go, leaving the camp uh, off to uh, make the uh, over the action at Bell Pass. And I was left with nothing to take photographs of, but mountains, my kit, my ski tracks, and one lovely shot of Kyrgyzia from the highest point I got to, which was actually really useful because it's just a point on the map. Whereas from this point, it was very clear that it looked as though there was a, a route coming up from the Karasay Glacier over behind this mountain, up between the two and giving you a, a ski ascent to at least that point. So uh, it was really useful to have wrecked that. So um, that was pretty much it. Uh, I was quite cheerful in my little camp. I did get some great weather. Um, it was warm, hot at times, and uh, I was very careful not to ski avalanche prone slopes. Um, picking my way down through rocky outcrops was sort of standard, standard fare, but it was lovely technical skiing, so I can't complain, you know, spring snow. So when they got back, we packed up huge sacks. Remember, we hadn't got pulks and went off looking like Christmas trees with all this stuff dangling off us uh, across the, the flats, which by now had thawed out a bit. There were patches of grass appearing so we could uh, have quite warm campsites without the snow underneath our um, carry mats and um, heading back to the uh, road through this not even foothills at this point and uh, there was quite a sense of regret I mean I remember Juice being stand leaning on this you know, and staring at the water for quite a while. We we were not thrilled to bits to be leaving. It was it was quite a special place, and there were certainly regrets about leaving it. In the background there, you can see Kyrgyzia from that side. Um, but the mountains we were exploring are out behind this rise. So that was the end of that trip. Um, but in 2006 there was uh, I, I was intrigued by the idea of going back I always meant to do it and put the offering there as a as an eagle expedition in 2006 and had a, another team um, take up take up the offer and uh, the plan was to get over the Suic pass get down to that bridge and we've been told there was a road leading up the valley to about this point here, which is where the Akbel Pass reaches these, these buildings here. And then the idea was to get onto the frozen river, travel in onto the glacier, up through here, out via the um, lake, and uh, we would climb whatever mountains we could en route. Obviously, it looks as though there's opportunities to right and left. More on that later. But uh, as it turned out, um, it didn't. Things didn't quite go to plan. So um, this was a team. This is at the end. We're all still looking cheerful. Uh, there's um, Alastair Cairns, uh, who was one of our doctors, and a seal, another, who did. Uh, great work for us putting the t putting the med medical stuff together and taking a load of responsibility off my shoulders. And then Mike Sharp again, he was enthused enough by the first trip to uh, to come along again. Uh, there's me, there's uh, Lizzie Hawker, who uh, was to go on to become, you know, it's, it's astonishing 
uh, athlete, uh, world 100 kilometer champion year after year, um, ultra trail winner on her first attempt, just a stunning athlete. Uh, to me at that time, she was just a, she was just a skier, you know, just another Eagle Ski Club member. Um, John Goodwin hiding behind there, uh, Derek Buckle, who I can see is watching now, and uh, we were we we had a good trip. Um, but this uh, this was the team. So we got over the Suic Pass all right, and then descending down to the river valley beyond the Karase Valley beyond, there was this little stream crossing which the guys overconfidently the drivers managed to get us stuck in and uh the guy the people on the team were very good at saying well you can jack up you know put some stones jack the car jack the vehicle up get stones under the wheels then we'll be able to get moving but the drivers i mean rima who was in the previous photo she was the chinese looking girl she is actually chinese it's a minority group in kyrgyzstan and uh, she was put, putting these suggestions to them and they were just dismissing them out of hand and sulking about the whole situation. So nothing happened for about five hours, no, four hours. And then a bunch of Kyrgyz turned up on horseback who then proceeded to do exactly that, loading, jacking the, <laughs> the thing up, throwing the stones under, getting the thing moving and uh, all, all, all credit to them. They, they, but they put in all the work carrying the stones and you know this sort of thing, which I think the drivers possibly felt was a bit beneath them. However, we did get going five hours after we should have done. So I'll go back to that. So when we got down to the valley, we were further delayed with getting our pass for the military area. And then eventually it was dark by the time we got to the river bridge over the Karase River. And the drivers there insisted there's no road up that valley, no road at all. We know, we've, we've checked it all out, there's no road whatsoever. And this was despite what we knew. And poor old Rima was in a position where we were telling her one thing, they were telling her another. And in the end, I thought, we're not going to get anywhere here. I went out and prospected for where the road might be running from the, the actual proper road and couldn't find anything so we camped by the side of the road and the drivers headed off with Rima back to Bishkek. In the morning we found the road and um, there it was uh, but it was a bit of a tricky access from the from the main road and it wasn't you know it was just a gravel twin tire tracks type of road but there was no snow on it and this was our first major setback after five hours uh, in that we had to get all our equipment, including the pulps, all the way up this valley, from here, all around here, right up to here. So double carries or towing the pulps, as this character is doing on the gravel, were our only options. I've, I suspect one of these two is Lizzie because she was so strong. She was just determined to carry the lot on her back. But um, anyway, we uh, did one or two double carries. We did some um, towing of pulks. We did some very heavy, heavy carries and just kept going. Eventually, at about the point where we would have got, if we'd gone over the Akbel Pass, we got down onto the river. But even then, although making good time on the snow and ice, this was not a complete ice covered river. And there were sections of nasty gravel and water that we just had to carry the stuff over. Various methods were adopted. There were even some extreme occasions when we had to unpack the pulks and backpack the lot over. But we did it. As you can see in the background, the, uh, we were getting more up into the snow line, but there's, there's not a lot of it. We headed on up the valley camp. This is the last camp on the river, on one of the gravel banks. And on the right side here, it, the, uh, another glacier came down to join the Karase. And uh, this from the Kayondi Pass there. But we were actually going around this corner onto the main Karase Glacier, further up in that direction. We did actually climb this peak on a subsequent expedition. 
But we were moving into the mountains now and it felt a lot better. More snow, reaching the end of the glacier. This is the, 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 an aspect of the snout. Big terminal moraines broken through by watercourses and uh, some of them were ice covered, some not so much. And several of us did go through at one time or another. Um, but this, we're getting towards the main part of the range now. We're getting proper skiable mountains uh, appearing. So we're a bit more cheerful. First camp on snow, actually on the glacier. It wasn't far from the snout, but we thought the weather was coming in, so we camped. And then the next day, we needed to uh, recce the glacier ahead because it looked quite complicated with these, um, you know, rock-covered ice in places, uh, rocky ridges, um, crevasses, broken ice cliffs. It was all looking complicated. So we thought we'd take a cache up and wrecky the glacier for a route through. Not particularly good conditions either, so that wasn't encouraging. We felt like having somewhere to retreat to might be useful. So up we went, weather clearing, big sacks, passing this ice fall, rope together in case of crevasses, and made a cache. Uh, this is up here is actually the um, an aspect of the southeast ridge of Kyrgyzia, which stretched down to the glacier. And then having made our cache, we skied back down through the, uh, the glacier to the camp. And these, the, you can see the nature of the, of the terrain, really incredible. I mean, Mike had uh, been on glaciers in you know, Asia, North America, Antarctica. He'd never seen anything like these features, which were reminded me more of um, sand dunes at times uh, than snow features. And it, in my mind, they, they, they appeared to be like a dunescape fashioned in snow. But you can also see some really quite attractive mountains are beginning to appear around us too. The following day, the weather was much better, so we broke camp, headed up. Again, on the left there, you can see these strange formations in the, in the ice of the glacier. Uh, this is John Goodwin and Mike Sharp uh, skinning up with, the, with porks this time. And we got to the cache and uh, took a break, had a look around. Anna and Lizzie thoroughly enjoying themselves. And I have to say, it was very nice to have women along on the on the on the trip. It was uh, it was salutary for the men. <laughs> so uh, this in the background here, this is the south face of Kyrgyzia, and this is the southeast, the end of the southeast ridge of it. So you can see it's quite a long ridge, uh, but we were not going to go up there. The probable route was up to the left here, keeping to the glacier until we could get up from the south. So we were looking for a campsite and in the end we decided on one just to the right here. And my camp. Across the valley, as I'd said, it looked like there were some interesting prospects for peaks that we could climb. But this intervening area of dunescape was very deterring, very, um, you know, discouraging in terms of crossing the glacier. So uh, it was quite a way to get up into this area. So having to negotiate these obstacles on the way and then get back made it really something that we were not prepared to consider. But we had some bad weather and then the following day uh, we went up in Bad visibility, but not, you know, not terrible. So we could find our way. We were using GPS way, waypoints to find our way back and managed to climb a peak that we glimpsed through some gaps in the cloud. Um, and by on the map, we managed to get up to the summit of this peak we called Sentinel Peak. Um, 
And everybody is still smiling, notice, at that point. And the day after, the weather fined up beautifully, so we headed up to Reki, the approach to uh, Kyrgyzia, established that it would go, but there was a terrific icy cold wind, so there was no way we were going to uh, do it that day. So we just established that the route was on and then skied back to camp, having done a bit of a late start because the weather didn't clear immediately. That's Mike and John. So then we had a nice time skiing back. Mike telemarking stylishly. I think this is Alistair um, paralleling down. Lovely snow. And then the day after, uh, we set out in good earnest, made an early start, got up to roughly the same point, and then continued to climb up to the right, steepening and gaining height all the time, before cutting back left again in order to gain the main summit ridge. And here's Alice there, on the summit, on his knees, giving thanks that we actually made it. So that was... Uh, and, it, you know, you looked across and you thought, wow, this whole range, you just everything you look at there hasn't been climbed. It's just like, you know, uh, can't quite believe it. So this was having skied down. Sorry. Uh, we came, we skied down here. The snow had whumped a couple of times on the skin up to the point where we left our skis and booted and cramponed up to the summit. So when we skied back, we skied down, you know, one at a time down the track of ascent until we got into the snow bowl again and could put in some turns coming back to here. But we all managed it successfully without triggering an avalanche and then could look back and see what we'd achieved. The summit is actually just going out of sight in the clouds there. Very nice ski peak. And then lots more skiing, getting back down. To a camp where we're beginning to feel quite at home, actually. It was, uh, it was a very nice location, quite sheltered, and uh, we, there was a good team spirit building, and uh, we knew where we were going, so that was, that was very nice. Set out again to uh, do a couple more mountains over the next few days. This is one of them heading up uh, this way to climb this one. Um, same pattern, ski, skin up as far as you can, then shift to uh, alpine mountaineering style with axe and crampons to climb what were often ridges or the flanks of ridges to the summits. Some of those are quite exposed. Uh, here's Derek going up onto, I think that was Peak Carga, Raven, because <laughs> just on the summit, these ravens came by really close and seemed to be croaking actually to us. You know, it was like the raven's message is here. Um, and we also climbed this peak over in the background later. Here's another one, and you can see this north face of Kyrgyzia there, which is very much more of a climbing objective than a skiing objective. So uh, those are the peaks we climbed earlier, but then we kind of ran out of objectives. We weren't keen on crossing the glacier, so Mike suggested we head up to the watershed of the glacier, the highest point uh, where we could make another camp and explore the mountains that were adjacent to that. And that's, this is the team loaded up with pulks again, heading up to do just that. Made a camp. Um, on this very flat open terrain, we felt we had to probe it very thoroughly to make sure we weren't camping over crevasses or walking around over crevasses. So we probed the whole area with uh, uh, probed ski probes and then um, 
use wands to indicate a perimeter beyond which was not safe. And so we can wander around quite cheerfully within that perimeter, but not beyond it. So um, these mountains looked interesting up here. So that's exactly what we went to do as soon as we had a good day to do it. This is on our way. Got to the coal between them. This is Lizzie taking a break. And that I think is uh, Peak Raven Carga in the background. These twin peaks, we reckon we could do them both in the same day. So that's uh, John and I think that's Alistair uh, climbing up to the first one, the higher one, um, that we ended up naming Hare Peak or Peak Coyon because we found actually found the tracks of a mountain hare going over the summit at over 4,800 metres. What it was doing up there, I have no idea, but we were pretty sure that's what the tracks were. And then once we'd done that, um, Derek and I set out to do this one up a series of steps and snowballs. But uh, let's stay with the first one. Uh, there was some good teamwork going on. People were appreciative of having, you know, uh, some rope support at times. Those were pretty exposed slopes if you slipped. But also, when you'll notice, we're not standing on the exact highest point because there were pretty substantial cornices on, on this peak, as on most of them, in fact. But what we did notice from the summit was looking this way, down the glacier we were going to descend to the Petrov Glacier, we could see this whole area of uh, other peaks and glaciated uh, terrain that looked like it could be an interesting place to explore on another occasion. Anyway, that's looking back from the second peak. We had been up there. Here's our track coming down and uh, the track going up the second one. And one last person making a leisurely descent. And uh, I say there were bowls and steps, but the actual summit was uh, quite a knife edge of snow. And here's Derek with his uh, axe in that knife edge, standing actually on the flank of it. So uh, it wasn't anywhere to not be confident in what you were doing. Uh, the weather again came and went, but we did manage to get over onto the east side too into another glacier bay, um, exploring that, hoping there might be a pass at the head of it. But when we got there, it wasn't a pass at all. It was a, just a very steep drop off, uh, which uh, led uh, down into another glacier bay. Yeah, sure. But below this edge, it was like this. So there was no way we were going to ski down it, let alone get porks down it. There might have been alternatives to get on ski around this way, perhaps, although we didn't know what lay below this shoulder. And uh, we certainly couldn't get pulks over it. So it was not a thoroughfare for us. Um, so just enjoying the prospect of these mountains and other possibilities. We had a bit of time in hand, so we decided to go for one of the peaks to the north, which um, this is the second of them. We climbed one, which was the only peak we managed to, to climb on ski to the very summit. But having got there, Derek said, you know, I think the one over there, that rocky one, I think that's higher. And these are just twin peaks, you know. So off he went with the rest of us following with varying degrees of uh, enthusiasm. <laughs> and, uh, when we got there, sure enough, uh, this peak, uh, that is the actual summit. And um, it was exactly the same height as the other one, <laughs> exactly to the meter. <laughs> so I decided it was a Twin Peak summit, uh, which I gave the name um, 
snow cannon too, because the one peak had been snowy and this looked like a pair of cannon just up at the sky. You know, you get limited imaginative trips at that altitude. So this is the actual summit with Alastair uh, having climbed right up to it. The rest of us, we all took turns because there wasn't any room for more than one person up on the top. So then we pretty much ran out of time. We weren't sure how easy it was going to be to get out of the uh, range. So rather than take any more time, we never picked up this peak, for instance, which was a gift really just sitting there waiting to be climbed. Um, but we packed up and headed off over this edge. Um, we had scouted that earlier just to make sure we weren't going to be heading for any drop offs in poor visibility and it looked fine. So packed up the camp, skied off down from the pass. Uh, from the watershed, managing the polks reasonably well. Um, it has to be said that our attempts to stiffen up the hall system by using plastic piping had not been very successful because the piping we used was wastewater piping, which shattered in the low temperatures and then had to be repaired with duct tape or, I have to say, thrown away, basically. Um, but big snow plows managed to keep the uh, pulks from, uh, from uh, rolling. In most cases, I think Mike had the worst experience. For some reason, his pulk just kept rolling. Um, and you can see him trying to sort it out there. I think that's Mike. But yeah, I was very pleased with my track. It just ran beautifully. My pulk was very well behaved that day. And then the glacier became more gradual in its descent, uh, asteric in the lead there. And this peak divided our descent glacier from the Petrov glacier in the bottom. And we later called it Peak Petrov when we climbed it on another expedition. Again, you can see these peaks look interesting over here. And subsequently we were gonna climb both of those in 2007. That was the exit down the glacier, avoiding the moraine ridges, trying to keep to the snow, trying not to get carried away down the ice where the skis had virtually no purchase and skittered around in a very alarming fashion. We ended up cramponing to the end of the uh, glacier. And there, that's the lake that we would hope to cross. Last camp on the uh, outwash, the Moraine outwash beach below the glacier snout. Uh, Lizzie and Anna pitching their tent. And then next day, unfortunately, the margins of the lake were not sufficiently frozen for us to get onto the lake ice. So we had a bit of a nightmarish um, traverse along this rocky shore towing our pulks, carrying our um, sacks and skis. And I have to say the team had worked really well getting off the glacier, really well uh, up on in the mountains and equally well helping each other out on the trickier parts of this traverse as well. In the distance, you can see the pumping station of the gold mine right on the shore of the lake, which pumped water out to uh, be used in the uh, gold extraction process. Okay. And this was our final camp. Uh, we were picked up by um, the security vehicles once we got into the mine precinct. The guys at the pumping station very kindly gave us uh, tea. And then we set off and were soon picked up by the security and transferred to this point, the abandoned um, meteorological station. There's a lot of those. As soon as um, Soviet finance disappeared, infrastructure like that disappeared with it. So um, that was gone, but it was a useful landmark for the agency to come and pick us up. And we, we had our last camp there and could look back at the range that we passed through, virtually parallel to these peaks.
And there you can see Kyrgyzia uh, from the northwest. And all the mine workings are not quite as horrible as they looked at like when there wasn't snow on them. But it's a massive enterprise. Okay, so that was really successful trip. Seven first ascents, most of them over 4,800 meters and the first traverse of the range. I think we all felt pretty good about that. But 2007 turned out to be a, um, the 150th anniversary of the Alpine Club. So uh, I was meet secretary at the time and there were, I was on the committee planning events and uh, I offered to start the ball rolling fairly early by going in the spring and doing, running a trip for Alpine Club members into this area that we noted the previous year. So uh, this was uh, uh, the, the, the plan originally was to get to the gold mine, travel across the lake, up the glacier, up here into this glacier bay that we'd seen, look at climbing these mountains, cross this pass, drop down onto this glacier, round here, maybe go up and investigate these bays, see if there were any possibilities perhaps of this pass here, but it looked a bit steep, and then escape back over this pass, down the glacier and out. That wasn't how, th how things turned out. We made two, went up, made three camps, one, two, three, and we did climb some mountains, but more about the problems that resulted in not fulfilling that in a minute. So uh, we got up with the usual approach, Isakul, Barskoon, up to the gold mine, very happy to accommodate us, escorted us, the security escorted us through. Um, there was a British guy in charge of security, which helped, I think. He was an ex-policeman with uh, firearms experience, and uh, he obviously worked out that we were no threat because our driver had actually got a pistol in his glove compartment, but they didn't confiscate it for him, <laughs> from him, which would have been normal procedure. They just thought, oh no, these guys are okay. So on we went. This was the team um, from left to right, Gethin Howells, young lad in his twenties, um, who'd been on, he'd been to the Pyrenees with me. Um, Adele Long, who was my partner at the time, uh, Gordon Nuttall, who had been on uh, Mount Logan with me, um, Stuart Gallagher, also on Logan with me. So it was a team of five and all Alpine Club members, but also all Eagle Ski Club members. As I said, it was very much an Eagle Ski Club affair exploring this, this range. And that's Sergey, uh, our host in... Uh, Tamgar near Barskoon, who was a previously, he and his wife, Julia, were previously Soviet masters of sport. Um, and they were having to, they just bought this building and converted it to a hostel uh, because uh, they were having to open the trekking business now. They weren't being supported uh, by the state. Okay. Not very good weather by the time we got onto the lake, but the lake ice was pretty solid and no problems about traversing over to the, the beach uh, camp here. Brightened up in the, in the evening, after, late afternoon, evening, and to our surprise, two other skiers appeared crossing the lake. I thought this is this is this is not on. This is our range. We keep it to ourselves, you know. But in fact, in fact, uh, they set. They weren't particularly sociable. They set up their tent about 70, 80 meters away, and so I let them get the tent up and get settled down. Then I sort of sauntered over to have a chat. They turned out to be two Dutch guys who had read my report, my MEF report from the previous year, and decided they fancied exploring the range. So we had one of those awkward conversations where are we going to be in competition or are we not going to be in competition and where are you going and well where are you going and uh, what do you intend to climb and what do you intend to climb and in the end discovered that we weren't in competition at all 
and they were heading in a completely different direction back up the way that we had come down the year before. So we were going completely in the opposite direction and that was fine. So we parted quite amicably and although I swapped email addresses with them, I emailed them to find out how they got on and never heard anything. Very strange. So we wrecked the glacier and finally worked out that the best approach would be to skin along across the lake ahead of the snout of the glacier where it collapsed into the lake, which had a very sort of uh, Arctic Antarctic feel about it doing it. And then beyond that, we could get on to uh, better glacial terrain to bypass the absolute minefield that had been the centre when we went up to have a look at it. It was just up and down of rocks and crevasses and horrible. So um, that, was, that was a plus. Very easy to get off the ice. We didn't have to climb any cliffs and then uh, skinned up the true right bank of the glacier and then onto the glacier itself, linking moraine ridges. Beautiful scenery again. I'm always struck by the quality of the, uh, the mountain scenery around there. Really is pleasant stuff. Impressive. Anyway, uh, we carried on up, um, branched off into the uh, leftward branching glacier, going up into the bay where we'd seen those attractive looking peaks. This was the way we'd come down the previous year and the lake is out in this direction. Established the camp and this is heading out on our first climb. We do, it had taken us a while and we'd had some bad weather and some rest days, rest days because we, we'd been having some trouble with altitude. It was a big jump, 2000 meters from Bishkek up to the lake in a, like, eight hours sort of thing. It was, it was hard. So we suffered a bit, but uh, the routes that I'd seen the previous year again worked out quite well once we got onto it. Traversing the south face here, then up to a notch on a ridge on the west ridge, and finally climbing up to the summit where we're all cheerful. Gordon didn't make it with us because his headache was so bad. So only four of us got to the summit on this occasion. And it was, um, it was, whoa, let's have a look. Uh, four, 4,836 meters. So higher than Mont Blanc. And we weren't sure we'd get up any other peaks given our like altitude problems and so on. So we decided we needed to name it in honor of the occasion. So we adopted the wordy Russian style and described it as peak of the 150th anniversary of the British Alpine Club uh, in true Soviet tradition. Uh, in the background here, you can see another peak which looked really good uh, that we wanted to try. But like I said, there were no guarantees at that time. Snow conditions hadn't been wonderful, so we were going to have to see how it went. This is a descent down the ridge and looking out past the, the mine workings down towards the road. And from the ski depot, we were then able to ski on down back to camp, enjoying some fine spring snow. I say spring snow, that was a danger is that it tended to get heavy if you left it too late, but very pleasant, quite forgiving if you caught it at the right time. And so uh, the following day, with Gordon this time, but not with Stuart, who had had a bit of a tumble and damaged his knee. So he decided to rest his knee up and um, just the four of us set out for this peak here, which we intended to climb up to a pass below this ridge 
and then follow the ridge and traverse, follow that snow ridge to the summit. So we actually discovered very fresh um, snow leopard tracks high up on this peak, which uh, looked as though the snow leopard had almost fallen into a crevasse and then had flung itself backwards and re-established itself on solid ground, then traversed away from where it had nearly fallen and eventually had headed off on the flank of this peak until we lost sight of where the tracks went. Again, you scan the area, didn't see any sign of it otherwise, apart from the tracks. At this point, it looked like take it, leaving the skis would be a good idea and to uh, climb the ridge on foot. So we're getting sorted out for this. And this is on the ridge. Climbing there, we've left, left our skis down below here somewhere. And um, the first part of the ridge was rocky, scrambly, quite pleasant, balancing up on, you know, kicking steps or using the rocks. And then um, higher up, leaving the rocks and traversing across snow on the flank of the ridge to get up onto the main summit ridge. Uh, that's where we were before traversing those slopes got to this point on the summit ridge, a bit of a, a saddle. And then the summit itself reared up ahead of us, which was quite a horn actually, um, steeper than it had looked when uh, from a distance. So um, we put a rope in, which was then, uh, you might just be able to see it if you've got good resolution and uh, brought up the team. And then um, when it came to descending, uh, the team abseiled down off the ice screw. Then uh, I took the ice screw out and was belayed down with a rope, but no gear, basically. So I wasn't going to fly off down to the foot of the mountain but I could have gone for a bit of a slide, I suppose. It's a, you know, acceptable risk, I thought at the time. Um, and then another peak appeared to be quite attractive, but then turned out to be very icy as we approached the rocky uh, summit crest. So again, we were forced to belay on this. Um, it was just really hard ice and the crampons were having difficulty getting purchase on it. Partly, I think, because we were so early in the day. The continuation rock ridge went up from there and that was really sharp, much sharper than expected. So we were only just about able to get us all on this narrow ridge of rock that was the main summit. And it was Stuart who came that time. Uh, Gordon was not feeling good. We weren't terribly successful on the health front, actually. It has to be said. But finally, all five of us headed out for another peak up above the pass that we wanted to cross. And as the weather deteriorated, we managed to summit. We'd left our skis below here. And this is a shot descending from the summit. And this, the peak overlooked the pass we wanted to cross. So we could look down into that territory here, which was, um, it was doable just about, but it was obvious that the glacier down below was a lot lower than where we were. And by that time, we were having a lot of problems with the snow conditions. We were skinning up glaciers and finding that the whole thing would lump and a vast plate of snow would sink about a foot with us on it. And obviously, if any of us 
had been over a particularly weak snow bridge at that time, we'd have been in. And we were also concerned about um, where the snow had built up, where there had been snow build up. It tended to be over ice, as you can see here. And as the temperatures had increased, it um, became more likely that we could get avalanches or trigger avalanches. Uh, and this was worrying us a lot. So we had a bit of a conference back at camp. There didn't seem a lot of op more options to do uh, for objectives to do from there. And so we decided to break camp and go down to the main petrol glacier and go up and see what we could do from higher up that, where there looked to be more peaks possible. Uh, and perhaps it would be colder. I don't know. It was a possibility. It's a big glacier. So we broke camp, loaded up the porks, and headed down to what proved to be a very pleasant camp on um, lateral moraine, snow-covered lateral moraine, with running water in a crevasse to one side, which was a bonus. And these peaks look, well, maybe, or maybe this one, Petrov, as we later called it, um, but... Nobody was very enthusiastic when we set out to explore very early in the day and found that not only were we getting this one ping taking place, but we also saw a, uh, an avalanche off one of the flanks. Can't remember if it was this mountain or the flank of this one. But, you know, this was like, was an afternoon avalanche. This was like nine o'clock in the morning. And... Uh, we began to get quite anxious about the conditions. So instead of attempting a peak, we just went up to the pass we'd been intending to use to see if indeed it was usable. And it turned out to be so. From above, we'd only been able to see this area, which had looked pretty daunting. But from close to, it was clear that there was a, a passage of uh, negotiable snow slope that could bypass this area and get onto this glacier. But even when you're over there, there was nothing particularly attractive about these peaks in ski mountaineering terms, or these, and that pass which had looked, you know, a potential crossing point on the map, looked incredibly steep from here. So there was nothing to really whet our appetites about going over the pass. You can tell we were getting uh, a bit uh, disillusioned about what, what was available for us to do. So back at camp, on the other side of the glacier, this peak reared up. Uh, and the only person who seemed to be keen to climb it was Gethin. So it was very strange that the following day, four of us set out to climb it, Gethin and Gordon and me and Adele. And Adele and I tried to do a sort of directissimi up the rocks to the summit ridge and across. But Gordon and Gethin were far wiser and traversed and picked up this snow gully, which took them up to a point where the snow slopes could lead to the summit. Adele and I turned back because we'd taken too long on, this, on these rocks, which just seemed to be so unstable that nothing did actually tumble, but it looked as though if it did, an awful lot could go. So we just, discretion was the better part of valor there. We retreated, had a conference, decided there wasn't anything more we could do. We might as well go back to Bishkek, do a bit of sightseeing, fly home early. Uh, we were sticking our necks out with the snow conditions and they reached a point where we weren't prepared to do so anymore. But it gives you an idea of how warm it had been in as much as the, um, what had been skiable, we ought to have been able to skin up this, but in the time, that we um, had been up on the mountain, it had, the snow had melted back to the point where we had to put crampons on and drag the sledges up, straight up this ice, icy snow, very thinly covered with uh, bits of spin drift, really. So it was hard work. And then skied down glacier, 
back to the outwash camp where we had our last camp and then despite appearances we thought we could probably get onto some decent ice to use the lake to get back and in fact overnight this which had been quite melted open water a lot of it there was two inches of ice the following morning after it had frozen that that's that hard so here we were walking out and then finally the last trip was very ambitious this was a line we were attempting to do come over a high pass above the act bell so we could drop the straight down to the junction of the two glaciers and then up this one down the other side of it and almost like a circumnavigation of the range going up these glaciers over this pass down here over that pass that we'd scouted up the way that we'd thought to come down and then ski into the same bowl and out over a pass in that direction or we had the option to escape that way or to escape this way back by a usual exit route. That was the plan. However, when we actually got, this was a team, sorry, I'll say a little bit more about that. When we actually got into this area, none of us felt fit enough or acclimatized enough to go over such a high pass so early in the trip. So we ended up crossing the Ack Bell again and then going up the river quite fast this time, and then followed this route. More later about how we didn't go this way. This was a team, uh, Mike again, Derek again, Jerry Seeger, who skied with me in Canada, and Robert West, who came along with uh, good references from crossing the Karakoram, on a, a, a traversy trip like that. So uh, we did, uh, we had a solid team of five. And the first thing that struck me and Mike in particular, when we were going to cross the Ack Bell was how little snow there was compared to 2003. It was remarkable. This was 2008, just five years. And we were actually going um, uh, in, it was, it was in May, so it was a similar time. It was like late April or early May. And yet the, the snow was virtually, I mean, I'd skied these slopes here and it was just remarkable. So we didn't waste any time about getting over the pass, crossed those river flats, headed down the drainage to, of, following the pass down onto the river, camping as necessary. There was more, strangely enough, although there wasn't as much snow on the ground, it must have been a hard winter because there was a lot more ice in the river. So we were able to follow the river much more easily, weaving between the uh, gravel uh, shoals. heading up into this glacier system here. Finally sorted out a camp quite near the head of that glacier pass. And then the mountains were just fantastically beautiful and pretty challenging. But we did notice this sheen of ice on things on slopes that could have been skiable in different conditions. Went up to the west, first of all, climbed a pretty straightforward 4,700 meter peak and uh, had a good time on that. Nice day looking over to uh, the mountains that we climbed before. Um, I think that's possibly Kyrgyzia behind my, no, that, I think that's Kyrgyzia, yes. Um, and 
this mountain is actually part of this side of the uh, of the uh, glacier. And as we were descending, it was pretty obvious that we could ski off this pass around here, up here, and do this peak, which looked a real stunner um, and quite a, an objective. So next day, that's what we did. It's heading up towards the ridge. If I go back, this would have been around about here somewhere. We passed uh, snow leopard tracks uh, again in the valley and also wolf tracks. So um, this was this was quite interesting to uh, be aware of all this wildlife around us that we were never seeing. In fact, sorry, this uh, we got to this point on the ridge and decided to to leave our skis here because um, it was, this was quite hard stuff, uh, not easy to skin on. We were using harsh ice, and, and so we thought that it was going to steepen up pretty soon and need to. Uh, switch to um, crampons and this seemed a safe place to leave the skis rather than pushing the boat out. Uh, carried on along that ridge some tricky bits. This is Derek and that's the main su summit. We actually, this is you know it's a pretty cheeky route actually. We headed straight up that in the middle with this remnant cornice that shed bits into this little bowl here and what amounted to a kind of crevasse ice cliff to the right but between was this kind of ridge of snow which was solid enough there was a little trace that there could probably be some kind of Bergschrund type feature here but we crossed it quite safely um, somewhat to our surprise, actually. <laughs> and then there's Derek on the top. You know, we're at uh, 4,980 meters, so very nearly at 5,000 meters here, looking out over the range. And wow, you know, it's just fantastic. This is where we hope to go into this um, northeast corner. And the idea was that we would go down the glacier behind this uh, lump of snow to this junction here and then head up this one. And I think the pass that we hoped to cross, I hoped to cross, was around this corner. But looking down from here, it was pretty clear that there wasn't enough snow down in this area to be able to uh, ski and tow pulks down around a back up it would be a lot of double carrying and we'd lose a lot of time. And then if this pass didn't go, we'd spend all our time having to retrace our steps. It would have been a real gamble. So we had a bit of a conference and decided that we weren't going to do that. But first of all, we had to get down the, the off that mountain and then uh, we were enjoying ourselves. So, we climbed another peak over to the west that was about 4.8, uh, similar to uh, the one we climbed earlier. The, um, we called it Step Peak because there'd been Step Peaks in it. And this one we called Prospect because we could see all the way to Prospect Pass where we'd camped on the watershed before. Climbed up to that very much enjoying it and keeping clear of the cornices <laughs> and then had some quite pleasant skiing down again no no powder that we'd found in 2006 it was all um, spring snow and some of it quite you know the later you were in the day the less easy it was to ski So having reached, having had a conference and reached the decision that we were going, not going to proceed with the plan, 
we we decided to return to the junction with the Petrov Glacier and then get out of the range that way, the way we'd gone before, but exploring the glacier bays to the east of that glacier rather than to the west this time. So here we are heading down to that junction. Very shiny ice around us. And then climbing up the glacier, again, you can see the melt effect. There's ice very close to the surface here. We went past the camp that we'd had for Kyrgyzia, went high on the glacier, crossed above all that horrific um, dunescape of snow that we'd seen before and camped um, here underneath these rocky cliffs, but not close enough to be subject to stonefall, fortunately. And we quite fancied this peak here. So went to have a little look, but there were others like this one, which turned out, sorry, no, that is that one. We went up, skied up to look at the pass, which didn't go, and then followed the ridge and the face, on the northwest face and ridge to get up to the summit. This was uh, traversing along that ridge. And this was getting around some of the awful, uh, or some of the steps in it, which were awkward, I meant to say, not awful, just awkward. But, you know, it was serious mountaineering, basically. And then uh, we got onto uh, this feature, which, if I go back, you can see up here. Which was like a great wave of ice. And uh, we were just, you know, climbing rope together, uh, but without, you know, like one ice screw each, which we weren't using. And <laughs> it was uh, just quite serious ice climbing. Derek said to me at one point, he said, I normally use two axes on this sort of ground. And I said to him, I know just what you mean. <laughs> And so it was some of the, Jerry was very up for it, even though he hadn't done much ice climbing before at all. So we got to the summit, fantastic viewpoint, great weather, really chuffed to bits. And then of course, we had to get back down off the thing, which was challenging. But here we are, we'd actually climbed this uh, ice up here onto there, to the summit, which was just over the top of that. So yeah, we were quite chuffed with ourselves about that. It's probably the hardest mountaineering that we did in any of the expeditions on that. I think it, we graded it, when we talked about it, we graded it about D minus Alpine, which is, you know, pretty hard stuff for ski mountaineering. Um, Yes, and then uh, there was another peak which looked interesting. So headed off for that, up to this coal, along this ridge and up. Until we got to, it was at the head of the cirque. So we got up there and there was a little cairn, neatly built little cairn there, which was really disappointing. Um, I was trying to figure out, you know, who might have put it, but then if the Dutch guys had gone up and camped where we camped, actually this would have been quite a reasonable objective for them. But Derek and I were onto the summit quite early, and while we were waiting for the others, we, we could see this one sitting up here, obviously higher, with very nice little alpine ridge leading to it. So after a couple of, well, shall we or shan't we, we did. We're headed out along the ridge, um, following it. That's 
where we'd got to, and this is the ridge, the lowest point we had a traverse via chimneys and ramps, and then climb up again on snow until finally, that's the entirety of the ridge, very pleasant, until we were on the, on the main summit, and then had to get back so as not to hold the others up for the descent. And doing that on the way back, you don't expect to find crevasses on a ridge, but we were trotting along quite cheerfully and suddenly Derek disappeared up to his armpits in a, uh, in a crevasse that we, uh, he was walking in the very footsteps that we'd use on the ascent. And it was like, well, I think we'd better rope up now then, haven't we? <laughs> so we roped up for the rest of it. Uh, and having done that, uh, we began on the descent, sorry, I'll go back to that. On the descent from that, actually, we found that we were, um, the snow was getting really, um, it was getting really warm and the snow conditions were getting difficult in the sense that there were obviously crevasses and we were skiing down. There was one occasion when I skied over a crevasse and the only reason I knew I'd skied over a crevasse was that hissing sound. And uh, I said to Mike, when he was supposed to be following exactly in my tracks, he didn't. I said, why didn't you follow exactly in my tracks? He said, because when you skied over that crevasse, it just collapsed, all the snow collapsed in. And I wasn't about to jump it. So he'd take the slight diversion. <laughs> and that was worrying us. So we thought we'd better make sure we can get out before things get too serious, went back up to the uh, to the uh, watershed pass, uh, pro prospect pass, and then um, descended the glacier. Uh, and you can see what the crevasse problem was like. I mean, Jerry was really unlucky at this point. We just stopped to regroup, and he just pulled up with his skis like sideways onto the slope. And he was unlucky to be right on top of the crevasse when he did so. So he just went in. Fortunately, he had the presence of mind to fling himself backwards at the same time and managed to get his ass on the side of the um, hole and then swung his legs out. So he didn't need any assistance, but he did have quite a close call there. And it was, you know, it was big enough for him to have gone in over his head, certainly. How far further down, I didn't go close enough to check. Uh, but the pulk didn't follow him, interestingly. Okay, so we skied down round to what had been the Moraine camp in 2007, which was very cosy, very spectacular, uh, the rock scenery around it. Uh, nice weather now, but unfortunately still getting warm. So we decided to try and climb this peak here, which that's the summit. This looks higher, but actually it's not. It's just the foreshortening effect. And oh, I'll just go back. We, we went around the foot of this ridge coming down here, got onto a glacier running down between this further ridge and this ridge and climbed it to a pass between these, sorry, these two peaks and then climbed the snow to the summit there. But the weather did deteriorate during the day so that this is, this is Derek and Jerry holding each other up in the teeth of the gale, which was blasting across the summit slopes. And uh, we, we didn't get into complications so that I could have a shot as well. So it was just, we were pleased to get up there and down again in one piece. Okay. After that, it was just a question of escaping from the range. We'd run out of time. We were conscious of the snow conditions deteriorating and that risks were becoming unjustifiable. So we decided to exit. That's the peak we did. That was the coal. And we climbed up that just there or the line beyond that and up to the top. So, um, oh yeah, we did find a cairn on the top of that, much to our disappointment. But again, 
there was no no trace of uh, who had placed it there. So we claimed it as a first British ascent. Um, and we did take the trouble to name it, having discovered that uh, no details have been lodged with the Kyrgyz Alpine Club. So they were quite happy for us to suggest a name for it. Pick Petrov. Not very original, but there you go. <laughs> okay, out of the range, skinning back across the ice. Oop. What happened there? That's it. And that was the end of the trip. Now, I'm, I'm very aware that I have galloped through this because there are like four expeditions to talk about. And there's loads of detail that I've missed out on that you may want to ask about. So feel free to ask any questions that are you know, bothering you. I've tried to give you an outline of what ha happened. We did some thorough exploration. We worked out, we made 17 first ascents in the course of those expeditions. We explored the southwest, the northeast, the east, and um, made the first traverse of the range. And um, there was still, obviously, if you think about the plan for this 2008 expedition, there was still stuff to be done in the far east of the range if another expedition would like to go there and suss it out. And the access, I think, will be easier because they were setting up a nature reserve uh, alongside the mine. And I think the other fact is that it would need to be much earlier in the season because of what we experienced. But the abiding impression that I was left with was of the effects of climate change on the area. And interestingly, I'd met uh, a Kyrgyz uh, climate scientist on a flight out on this occasion. And we were just talking about climate change. And he said, to Kyr Kyrgyzstan is experiencing um, uh, a rate twice as great as the average for the world. And in by 2050, there will be no glaciers in Kyrgyzstan if we don't do something about it. So there's a lot hanging in the balance there. And I think some of that sense of accelerated um, climate change in the area was impressed on me by the changes I'd seen year after year in this area over a, a a sort of five-year period, only a five-year period. Um, so anybody going into it again, I think would have to look at going at the end of February, March, rather than April, May, in order to get decent snow conditions. So um, let's hope that we can do something about the climate change and that we don't lose these beautiful glaciers and beautiful mountains. So I'd like to leave it there and uh, if there's any questions, do feel free to, to ask. Thanks, Dave. That's a, a really impressive exploration of the range. Um, and my question, and I suppose, um, and there's a question from Bob as well, was about that timing, which you've uh, covered in that last bit. But um, it, uh, it does seem as if, you know, what, five years later, much earlier would be uh, would be the time to go. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions from anybody? If, if they want to, you could just unmute and um, uh, and join in if you've got any questions or, or comments. Can I, can I make a quick comment? Derek here. Sure, sure Derek. <laughs> well, it certainly brings back memories. I was on two of these uh, expeditions and I really thoroughly enjoyed them. It's the sort of thing I really like doing. Um, and as Dave says, there's a lot, lot to be done there. I think what the slides did show is major changes. I think we always went in April, at least when, when I went, it was April both times. And the conditions are obviously definitive about what you can do. So you go at any time you are very reliant on what the conditions are like at that particular time. But the mountains are absolutely fantastic. And we did leave a few for other people to climb. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Mike. Um, well, thank you. Mike just says, uh, um, 
quite some adventures and more sobering evidence of climate change from Mike Holmes. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, any more uh, questions? Uh, I'm aware the time has, has pushed on, but uh, thanks, Dave. That was a really excellent uh, sequence of, of, uh, of expeditions. Uh, fairly comprehensively exploring the, the range. I'm sure you've left a few, but not uh, um, not too many. Well, yeah, it's interesting you should say that because I'm aware now, having done some re recently into subsequent developments, I've found that they are there are commercial trips going in ski mountaineering, and they've clear the Kyrgyz. Alpine Club, who like run mountaineering in the country, have clearly used our names, the ones that we suggested for the peaks in their references, because there were in particular, I think, Wolf Peak, that big one, fourth, nearly 5,000 metres off the Kyondi Pass. That one is now quite a target for people coming in from the south, uh, from the road beyond the river crossing. Um, and other peaks have been referred to, and people are starting to go in in the summer for alpinism too, Russians mainly, but you know it's happening. So and there's but as Derek said, there's loads of opportunities to do stuff there. I mean, you look at some of the faces that we couldn't think about skiing that would be fantastic alpine routes, and it's big stuff, you know. It's it's. High altitude mountaineering in anybody's book, basically. Yeah.